we'll warn everybody now, and I will again, right when the program's ready to start, that we are recording tonight. So by staying online, you're consenting to be here for it. You're welcome to keep your video off if you choose. And uh, once we start, to, we're going to ask everybody to mute themselves also. But in the meantime, you're welcome to chat a little bit. I'll see you. Oh, we're, we're almost on time. Before we get started, Richard, if you can hear me, Richard Martin, what is the cool photo behind you? Oh, maybe you missed me on that. Good tiger. Claire, as long as you're not muted, you can no, say. No, okay. Hi. I just I, I, had, I, I couldn't find the unmute. What was that? Okay. I was asking about uh, the panoramic the photo. photo? You. I, I, can't I got see that well. from um, the um, one of my railway magazines, and it is a 365 degree photo of a rail yard back in the early 30s, I believe it was. And what's unique about it, outside from being a 360 degree view is it's got everything. It's got diesels, steam, and electric locomotives on that picture. And I had to get it custom framed because the glass is not a standard size. It goes wider than usual. So it, it took me a bit to get the thing framed. Very good, that's a great shot. Thanks for letting us know about that. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. All right. The picture was nothing, but the frame was really yeah. expensive. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's often the case. Yeah. Dan Cornelli, thank you so much for joining us again. It's oh, hello, Jim. You. You're down in Florida? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, lovely. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Great seeing you. Yeah, thank you. If you're ever back in town when everything is back open again, I hope you'll let us know and come visit us at the museum. Oh, will do. Absolutely. Great. What part of Florida are you in? Naples. Yeah. Yeah, very nice down here. Nice town. Nice yeah, beautiful town. day today. Dan Always. was the uh, Marine Logistics Manager for Inland Steel and those mills that came after it. And so he knows the subject inside and out and was the guy behind the scenes for a lot of the modern maritime history. Yeah. All right, we're a minute after seven. I'll uh, talk about a few other things while we wait for a few last people to sign on. Um, as you know, we've been closed for the past year because of the pandemic, and then we had a flood back in May. We're just about put back together. We're hoping maybe around June we're going to be able to reopen for this year. We don't have an exact date yet, but we are looking forward to reopening and seeing everybody again. Um, for those of you who are not members, we'd love to have you as part of the group. Uh, you're welcome to always join us here, but memberships are important. Uh, it really helps out the group. So if you're not a member, please consider joining, going to chicagomaritimemuseum.org. And I think under the support link is where you'll find memberships. So- Wait, uh, wait, it's also in the chat, Jim. Ah, excellent. Thank you, I'm not keeping up with the chat. Thank. Thank you so much to you and Veronica for taking care of the chat. It was Ronnie. Very good. All right. Um, also, while we've been working on getting place put back together, we're now really deep into designing new exhibits and we're making good progress on that. Uh, we hired a great design firm of Lafferty Van Heesten Associates that we're working very diligently with and in the near future, we'll have some great new exhibits to entice everybody to come back and see us again. Um, quick reminder, tonight's program is being recorded. So you don't have to keep your video on if, if you've got a problem with that. Uh, but just a warning that your presence here is agreeing to being part of the recording. And our speaker, Neil Zoss, has also agreed. Um, we're about 7.03. I'll just start doing a slow introduction of the speaker and we should be fine with the last few people signing in before we get started. Um, let you know that next month, our third Friday program is going to be about the whaling bark progress, which it doesn't, progress is the name of the boat. 
It sounds odd that we're having a program on a whaling bark, but it came to Chicago for the 1893 World's Fair and spent the rest of its life here, which was not its plan. But it's a really fascinating story. And it's it just tells many aspects of the whaling industry, the shipping industry, um, the World's Fair, the museum industry. It's, it's gonna be a fascinating program. And our own Ted Karamansky will be interviewing uh, mm. the author, uh, Daniel Gifford, who's a professor down at uh, University of Louisville. And so that's gonna be a great program next month. I hope you'll come back and join us. But for tonight, we're really pleased to have Neil Zoss here from Holland, Michigan with us. Uh, used to be before the pandemic, a year wouldn't go by that I wouldn't run into Neil somewhere around the Great Lakes. And he's a wonderful guy to chat and visit with. He's been researching Alexander McDougall's and his whalebacks for over 35 years now. He wrote his first book in 2007. It was called McDougall's Great Lakes Barges. And I counted today, there's 186 really great photos in it. And it tells the story behind each of those photos. So it's a wonderful book. And then in 2016, he wrote Whalebacks Wrecked, Scrapped, Lost, and Forgotten. And for any serious Great Lakes Maritime researcher, this is the encyclopedia of whalebacks that we all turn to. So if you need to know everything there is to know about whalebacks, here's your book. I've got to pick a copy of that up. It's, it's a good one to have. I think you'd find it really useful. Okay. <laughs> um, a little more background about Neil. He uh, graduated from Nazareth College in Kalamazoo. He studied business administration and finance while he was there. He, uh, his career was being a police officer, and the end of career, he was in Florida working as an investigator. And uh, we're certainly glad that he kept researching Great Lakes history, and especially whalebacks all that time. He's an amazingly avid book collector, and because you're in Chicago tonight, we're not going to mention that you're a rabid Detroit Tigers fan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you do live in Holland now with uh, your wife, Judy, and your two, as you put it, thoroughly recalcitrant shih tzu puppies i yes. hope they're going to be well behaved tonight they, uh, uh, we don't have to many groups them. you're a member of many groups including the uh, michigan shipwreck research associates the great lakes historical society the friends of the meteor and the superior wisconsin public museums so really glad that you were able to take time out from your very active research and work with other groups and uh, we're thrilled to have you here so Welcome, Neil Zoss. Thank you, Jim. I do appreciate the uh, the offer and the opportunity to to talk with you all about the uh, the ugliest boats in the history of the Great Lakes, the whalebacks. You know, it's uh it's been about three hundred and twenty five years. Let's see if we can't. Uh... We're gonna bring everybody. No, that'll work. Hi, Valerie. Oh, hey. About uh, 325 plus years, uh, folks have been running boats on the Great Lakes. There have been barges and, and barks, passenger ships, uh, cell phone loaders, paddle wheel loaders, lumber hookers, car ferries, um, uh, aircraft carriers, and uh, the odd German submarine. And those thousands of boats, they've been large and small, they've been uh, wood and, and steel, they've been fast and slow, they've been pretty, and then they're the whalebacks. Um, the whalebacks caused quite a sensation when they, uh, when they were introduced on the Great Lake. Let's just, well, let's just, let's just, we're going to, 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 we're going to,
I just want to remind everybody else that if you haven't muted yourself, please mute yourself through the program. I think the echo is because Valerie carried her computer into the room there. What? What did you do? I put it on TV speakers. Hold on just a sec. That's what we did last time, now that you mention it. Where did you do it? Audio? Sorry, folks. All right. If everyone else could mute themselves, that'd be great. And make sure there's no other outside noise for the program. Okay, Valerie, we muted everybody, including you. So if you could unmute. So Valerie, me. you can unmute. I muted everybody so that to solve the problem. So just unmute yourself. No, I think we're. Okay, I think we're going to be back. Are we back? Do you hear us? You seem great. Everything okay. looks good. We hear you fine. There we go. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> The, uh, the picture we're looking at now is, is basically the standard launch photograph of Barge 101. And what we're going to do tonight, briefly, is go through the, the history uh, of the, the whalebacks. And a little, we're going to talk a little bit about Alexander McDougall and his, his American Steel Barge Company. And then we're going to focus on a couple of the more famous whalebacks. Um, with a little, a little more in-depth information on them, just so people have a kind of a flavor for what these boats were and what they did, why they were so unique in the history of our, our Great Lakes. Um, the first whale back, Barge 101, uh, shows the very, very characteristic whale back design. You can see from the photograph, it has very pointed bow and stern. It has two small turrets, fore and aft. It has a very rounded hull. And that hull is, for all intents and purposes, nothing more than a large metal tube. Um, very few of the whalebacks were, were segmented or compartmented. Uh, so it was basically a very long, empty tube to put bulk cargo in. Uh, mostly at the at the outset of their their careers, mostly um, iron ore. Um, you can probably take a look at that picture and see that it's not. It's kind of a utilitarian boat. It. Uh, there's not a lot of frills when it comes to, to Alexander McDougall's barges. Um, I, I'm trying not to use the word ugly here, but that's pretty much what it is. It's, it's just, they're not pretty boats. Um, the reason that they, that Alexander McDougall put these boats to, together and the roundness of the boats was so that the wind and the waves while the boat was moving would create less friction and therefore a more uh, more money for the the owners and truth be told all of the the romantic stories about the great lakes and the boats and the sailors really the only reason to drop a boat into the great lakes was to make money and that's exactly what they were trying to do, make more money. Um, the, the Great Lakes sailors didn't take kindly to the initiation, of the institution of whale backs. Um, they called them pig boats because of the snout-like bow. Um, it's certainly not the kindest term ever hurled at a whale back boat, but in all honesty, it's not that... Uh, not that inaccurate 
a uh, a, uh, a term. You can see that you could probably put a tail and some uh, ears on that barge and you could call it Porky. I mean, you can see the, the snout and it really does make the whalebacks pig boats. This is a, this is a great picture of, a, of four whalebacks the uh, the whale back in the back right is a steamer, and then there are three barges. At, this is at the Sioux Locks, and you can see on the the two barges in the in the foreground that the the uh, hatch covers are are bolted flush with the the weather deck, and that. Again, is part of the part and parcel of the the uh, efficiency process. The Alexander McDougal was trying to figure out the less stuff that was was interacting with the waves in the water, the easier it was going to be for that boat to go through the water, and the cheaper it was going to be. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, this is a this is a not unusual for a whaleback steamer. To be towing three barges, um, a lot of them towed two, a lot of them towed one, and it was for economic reasons. Completely. Excuse me, Neil. Just for a second, I want to ask everybody to make sure you got yourself muted. We're picking up a lot of background noise, so if everybody could check and make sure that you're muted. Thanks a lot. Sorry, Neil. I'll let you go on. That's okay. If you take a look at the uh, the barge on the left forefront. You can see that the uh, the protection that the uh, the wheelman had against the uh, gales of November and the snowstorms and the rainstorms was basically canvas. Um, the creature comforts on these boats were almost non-existent. So uh, I'm sure that uh, several of those those folks in that pilot house had some very nasty things to say about Alexander McDougall um, and his lack of, of protection from the from the wind and waves. The uh, the grand scheme of the whalebacks was to carry more coal, more iron ore at a less cost per mile. And that's exactly what they did. Um, at the outset of their their lives, the whalebacks were significantly more efficient and more cost effective than their wooden brethren. Um, the the efficiency that that uh, the whalebacks brought to the to the uh, the trades on the Great Lakes really. Uh, increased exponentially their their numbers very quickly. Um, in 1889, I'm sorry, in 1888, there was one barge built, barge 101. In 1892, I'm sorry, in 1889, there were two. In 1890, there were six. In 1891, there were nine. In 1892, there were 10. Um, after 1892, the, uh, the building of the whalebacks and actually the building of almost every boat on the Great Lakes um, slowed to a crawl because of something called the financial panic of 1893. Um, it really put the, the, the skids on the economic juggernaut that was the Great Lakes at that time. Um, in 1893, there were six of the whalebacks built. In 1894, there was one. Um, in 1895, there was one. In 1896, there were four. In 1897, there were none. And the last whaleback, the Alexander McDougal, was built in 1898. And there was only one of those built in that year. The, uh, the picture you're seeing now is the Colgate Hoyt. This was the first whaleback steamer 
built by Alexander McDougall and the American Steel Barge Company. Um, there were five barges built prior to this one. Um, it was built at a cost of $120,000. So there's a, there's a feeling uh, with some folks that these, these boats were kind of a fly-by-night haphazard kind of process. And they were not. They were, they were well-built um, and they were, they were constructed of excellent materials. Uh, they were built to last, um, and they were built to carry as much cargo as they possibly could. She was 284 feet long. She had a beam of 36 feet and a depth of 22 feet. And she could carry 3,000 tons of cargo. Um, she had a four and a half compound engine that ran at about 725 horsepower. The... Uh, the, the steamer sailed the Great Lakes and then the Atlantic seaboard uh, until the day after Christmas in, in 1909 when she ran into a, uh, a sandbar outside the, uh, the mouth of the Toms River in New Jersey. The crew was rescued by several um, uh, of the, the uh, Coast Guard, I'm sorry, the uh, U.S. Life Saving Service stations in the nearby area, but the storm just wrecked the boat. As a matter of fact, if you go out there now, uh, about 50 feet off the, uh, the mouth of the Toms River, you can still see her boilers uh, that are still uh, underneath the water and evidently a magnet for some of the scuba divers in the area. This is one of the uh, earlier barges, whaleback barges. Um, as you can see, there's probably not going to be a lot of deck tennis on the, on the deck today. Um, and you can also, right smack dab in the, the middle of the, the deck, you can see that fairly large, those three fairly large piles of coal. And there is one guy with a shovel looking at those piles um, thinking he's got an awful lot of work to do ahead of him. Um, the, the, uh, the loading and unloading of whalebacks was for all intents and purposes a, a by the hand and by the shovel process. Uh, so it did take longer than it should have. One of the things that I love about this picture is on the back of the pilot house, you can see that that's covered with the uh, ubiquitous canvas, but in the back of it is the one and only safety feature of the whaleback barges. And that is that yawl. They didn't have anything else to save the crews except that boat. Um, again, utilitarian to the max. There were no creature comforts on these boats at all. The, uh, the next photo is the Charles W. Wetmore. The, uh, one of the things that Alexander McDougall and the American Steel Barge Company liked to do was tinker with their designs. And if you take a look on, that, on the, the weather deck of the Wetmore, you can see those four small turrets that are between the aft turrets and the, the bow turret. That was an experiment that Alexander McDougall tried, wherein he loaded the boat with as much cargo, mostly iron ore, as he possibly could. And then he loaded those small turrets with the same cargo. The idea was that while the boat was moving, and the cargo was settling, the cargo in those small turrets would filter down into the cargo hold and there would be no way for the, the cargo in the hold to shift because there would be no uh, space between the top of the cargo and the bottom of the, the hull or the, the bottom of the uh, top deck. Well, that didn't work very well. 
um, unfortunately. The only thing that the, those four turrets did was allow the, the crewmen to walk above the weather deck. On, it's difficult to see, but if you can take a real close look at that, there is a catwalk uh, that runs from the aft superstructure to the to the uh, turrets and then to the front main turret. That was a, a very nice improvement because before this, the only way you could get from the from the back to the front or vice versa was to walk on that weather deck, and if the if the whale back was loaded and there was about a two foot sea, you got wet. And so it was, uh, it was a, a nice little, didn't last. So uh, the, the, the wet moor um, ran on the west coast of the United States um, for a couple of years. It was finally lost, um, in September of 1892, off of Coos Bay, Oregon, it ran into the uh, to one of the the uh, sandbars just outside Coos Bay and was torn to pieces by a storm. The crew was saved. Um, there's an interesting, very interesting story about the long, long time it took the the uh, the boat to to break up and the the many attempts that several people made to save the boat, which never came to fruition. This is the, uh, the steamer Bayport. Uh, Bayport was launched as the, the E.B. Bartley in July of 1891 from Superior, Wisconsin. She's 264 feet long. She is 38 feet of beam and 24 feet in depth. And she could carry 3,000 tons. Um, the E.B. Bartlett was an experiment again. Um, as I said, the Alexander McDougall and the American Steel Barge Company were always trying to look for an edge, always trying to improve even slightly their product, their, their whalebacks. Um, she was a, a, an experiment in propulsion. There was uh, some kind, there was a there was some consternation in the American Steel Barge Company that the engines that they were putting in their whalebacks, um, mostly American engines, uh, triple expansion steam engines, were not doing the job as well as they could. And so in the E.B. Bartlett, um, American Steel Barge Company put in an English um, triple expansion steam engine. And the sister ship of the E.B. Bartlett, the A.D. Thompson was outfitted with an American triple expansion engine. And they very carefully monitored the, uh, the efficiency of those engines. And it, it was determined that the American uh, engines were significantly more effective and efficient than the English engines. So the E.B. Bartlett was the only whaleback that ever had uh, an engine that wasn't American made. Um, she ended her days as a wreck in the Cape Cod Canal uh, in, in 1916, December of 1916. Um, and the circumstances surrounding this wreck were so convoluted and so contested that the the final uh, legal process involved with this boat and the, the Cape Cod Canal was settled by the United States Supreme Court. Um, for those of you who are deeply interested, it's White Oak Transportation Company versus Boston Cape Cod and New York Canal Company, 258 US 341. Um, and at the conclusion of the, of the court process, none other than Oliver Wendell Holmes, the, one of the more famous Supreme Court justices rendered an earth shaking decision that basically said, everybody ought to play nice, go home and pay their own bills. Um, so I don't think anybody got the, the relief they were looking for at that time. 
the Thomas Wilson, um, one of the, the more famous whaleback steamers. And behind the Wilson, you can see there's a, a whaleback barge. They're both coming up on the, uh, the wall at the Sioux locks. Um, the Thomas Wilson was launched in April of 1892. She was 320 feet long. She was 38 feet of beam and she was 24 feet of depth and she could hold 3,300 3, tons of cargo. She had a triple expansion engine that could push her along with about uh, 1,200 horsepower. Um, I, if you're taking notes, you can see that the barges as they are being built later and later are bigger and bigger and more powerful. Um, this was, again, one of the technological processes that McDougall and, his, and the American Steel Barge Company were looking for um, to try to make their boats better. Um, the Thomas Wilson sank just outside the Duluth Harbor on the sunny, cloudless summer morning, June 1902, when the, uh, the steamer George G. Hadley made the, uh, the nautical equivalent of an illegal left turn and slammed into the starboard side of the, the Thomas Wilson, cut her almost in half. And nine of her crew died when the Thomas Wilson sank within minutes of the, uh, of the accident. The Samuel Mather, who launched in uh, May of 1982 in Superior. She was 320 feet long, 38 feet of uh, beam and 24 feet of depth. The same uh, dimensions as the Thomas Wilson, but there were some internal changes made to the uh, cargo hold of the Samuel Mather, and she could hold 3,500 tons of bulk cargo as opposed to the 3,300 um, of the Thomas Wilson. An example, again, of more tinkering by the folks at American Steel Barge Company. Um, I've always thought it's very interesting that there's a, uh, uh, a Masonic symbol on the, the stern of the Samuel Mather. I have no idea why. I've never seen that on any other whaleback. Um, and it does look like this was uh, taken on something like take your daughter to work day because there are three kids and uh, three women on board the boat, the Samuel Mather, when this photo was taken. One of my favorite pictures of the whalebacks is the James B. Colgate at the Sioux. Um, it's my favorite for a, a number of reasons, but one of the things that this photo just illustrates very well is the, the evolution of the shape of the whaleback hulls. If you remember, when, uh, when you saw the picture of barge 101, it was very round very round it was a, it was a pipe in in the water um the the tendency of mcdougall and the american steel barge company was to flatten and widen the hulls into what's kind of called a soft rectangle um throughout the years that they were made one of the other things that's very neat about this photograph is there's a whaleback barge behind um, the James B. Colgate. And there's a third whaleback barge behind the doors um, of, the, uh, of the lock. And also, if you take a look on both sides of that bow turret, you see something that Alexander McDougall dreamed up, patented. Those were his. Uh, patented whaleback McDougal anchors. Unfortunately, they didn't work very well, but every whaleback had them. Um, and they they were only on whalebacks. They they were never uh, they never made any strides to get on on other boats. Just the whalebacks. Um, there's a a, a uh, whaleback anchor up in Duluth, 
from the Thomas Wilson that was recovered. And there's one in uh, Virginia. Those are the only two that I know about that are still in existence. Um, this is a photo of the John Erickson. This was the first whaleback steamer with the pilot house forward. Um, she was launched in, in July of 1896. She was 404 feet long. She had a beam of 48 feet and a depth of 50, uh, 27 feet. And she could carry 5,800 tons of cargo. Again, one of the technical processes that, that McDougall tried to work with in, on the, the John Erickson was an, a system of internal supports to try to allow the boat to carry more cargo. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. The, uh, the boat actually carried less cargo than it could have had the internal supports not been in place. Um, John, the John Erickson was called the Johnny Grunt by her crew. Um, and she may not have been a successful experiment, but she was an extremely successful boat. Um, she sailed the Great Lakes from 1896 until the middle 1960s. Um, she was finally scrapped in Hamilton, Ontario during the winter of 1967-1968. Um, the longevity of the boat was just remarkable. Uh, very, very few other Great Lakes boats um, had, a, had a history that long. This is one of the, uh, the later barges. This is barge 129 um, in Ashtabula, if I remember correctly. Um, she was launched in... Uh, 1893, and she was lost on Lake Superior when her towing steamer tried to come around and pick her back up when she broke her tow line. And the towing steamer, the Manuola, uh, unfortunately smashed a hole in her port side with its anchor, and the boat went down very quickly, about 30 miles off of a million point in Lake Superior. You can see on barge 129, it also has one of the uh, Alexander McDougall patented anchors. Um, the, uh, the boat behind her is called the Andaste. The Andaste was called a semi whaleback because she had some of the characteristics of the whalebacks, but she had a cutwater bow and she had a tumble home hull, which really didn't uh, classify her as a whaleback. But she did look as ugly as the whaleback, so a lot of people call him a semi whaleback. Um, the Andaste was lost in Lake Michigan, probably no more than 30 miles from where I'm sitting in uh, September 1929 with the loss of her entire crew. The Anatokan. Did you ever have one of those days? This, is, this has got to be a nightmare for anybody driving one of these boats. Um, she was built as, as the John B. Trevor in May of, of 1895. And this picture was taken in uh, August of 1913 after the steering gear failed as she was going down the St. Clair River at Marine City, Michigan. Um, the boat ran up on the shore, ran over a dock and a small wooden building. And uh, ironically, um, the, the boat came to rest very close to the photographic workshop of a guy by the name of Pesha, who took many, many very famous Great Lakes photos of the ships in the early, uh, in the early 20th century. His, he was not home at the time, so he didn't get pictures, but I, I've always wondered what the insurance guy was thinking when he got that report. You know, what? Your boat ran over what? I, you know, how does that happen? I don't know. But um, the Alexander McDougall, this was the last whale back to be built. This was the, the last hurrah, um, the last experiment for the whalebacks. 
Um, she was the largest whale back ever built. She was 430 feet long. She had a beam of 50 feet and she had a depth of 27 feet. She could carry 6,800 tons of cargo. To be honest with you, if the name Alexander McDougall wasn't on this boat, I think we'd all be hard pressed to actually call it a whaleback. Uh, it has a cutwater bow, unlike any other whaleback. It has that forward pilot house. Um, it has no turrets. The, the, the hatch covers are, are not flush. For all intents and purposes, the Alexander McDougall is not a whaleback, but it was named after the guy who invented them and dreamed them up and made them. So we're calling it a whaleback. Um, she was scrapped um, in Hamilton, Ontario uh, during the, the winter of 1946-1947. This is the gentleman that created all the craze, uh, Alexander McDougall. Um, he was a dreamer. He was a businessman. He was a ship captain. He was a risk taker, a visionary, uh, a pillar of the Duluth Superior community. Uh, for all intents and purposes, you're looking at a photograph of a, a Renaissance man from uh, the 19th century. I mean, he did, he had his fingers in so many things. Um, he had a backbone that, that had to be made of titanium because when he started talking about his design for the whalebacks, no one, no one thought it was a good idea. Uh, and he went ahead by himself in the face of criticism that had to be very stinging. Uh, to build the first whaleback, Barge 101, with his own money, $40,000 worth at that time. I believe this is whaleback 102 or 103. Um, it's not Barge 101, uh, but it's a very early whaleback barge. And you can see that how the, the uh, labor intensive process was was certainly in effect at this point. And one of the things I love about this picture is the horse and buggy at the bottom of the screen on the on the right hand side. Uh, th this was a boat, metal boat, steel boat, made without anything but hammers and rivets and and um, uh, some forges. I mean, these were these were tough guys making tough boats in during tough times. Um, the uh, the next photo is a picture of Alexander McDougall. He is the the gentleman on the right with a, a couple of his cronies, and it shows the interior of one of the earlier barges. And it, it, I like this photograph for the fact that it shows the the uh, the guts of the barge uh, before they put the plates on the bottom of the, the uh, cargo hold. You can see the, the ribs and the stringers. Um, it's, I, I always thought this was a very unique photograph. And here we have uh, whalebacks under construction. It, it does look like it's lunchtime when they took that picture because nobody's working on the boat. But um, one of the, uh, one of the things that Alexander McDougall did was during the construction process of his whalebacks, he had construction crews going from boat to boat to boat doing the same jobs. One crew would lay the keels and, and work the ribs. One crew would put the, uh, the plating on, in the internal plating. One crew would put the the, uh, the plating on the, the outside of the boat. And the, once they were done with that job, they would go to the next whaleback um, and do the same job. It was kind of a, uh, a uh, Henry Ford process in reverse. The product didn't move, the people moved. So <laughs> um, 
you know, I think he was a little bit ahead of his time when he was when he was working that process. Um, here are several whale backs. You can see the one in front is just being started. It's got its ribs and some of the plating on it. The, the, the one behind it is a little more finished, and the one behind that is even more finished with all the plating on it. Um, that's how they built those boats, uh, and there was there was no change from that process from barge 101, well, from barge 102 until the Alexander McDougall. Um, Alexander McDougall, they called him the captain. Now, this is a photo of him about 55 years old. Uh, he was born in Scotland um, in 1845. He emigrated to Canada with his family when he was nine years old. Um, when he was 10 years old, his father was killed in a sawmill accident, and he stepped up. Uh, he had two sisters and a brother and his mother, and he stepped up and started uh, working for a living at age 10. Um, his, his formal schooling was almost nil. Um, he was a barrel maker, a log splitter, a fisherman, uh, a, a, a blacksmith. Um, he picked up jobs wherever he could to help his family. At age 16, in 1861, McDougall joined the ranks of the Great Lakes Sailors uh, when he began working on a, a, a steamer by the name of the Edith out of Collingwood, Ontario. Um, he worked a series of boats and very, very quickly uh, became a second mate, a wheelsman, a pilot, and then a first mate. Um, this is a guy that had drive like nobody's business. At age 25 in uh, 1870, he earned his master's papers. He was one of the youngest masters on the Great Lakes. Um, and he became the captain of the Thomas A. Scott, the steamer Thomas A. Scott, uh, in 1871. In 1877, he became the the uh, captain of the Japan, one of the triplets that many people are, are aware of. In 1880, he became the captain of the steamer Hiawatha. Um, after building the, the whalebacks, Alexander McDougall didn't put his, his tail between his legs when they basically failed. Um, he went on to build ocean-going freighters during World War I uh, in the McDougall Duluth Company. Um, he was granted close to 40 nautical patents by the U.S. Patent Office. He owned a company that insured hulls and cargoes uh, on the Great Lakes. He directed most of the stevedores in the Upper Lakes. Um, he was the president of the Northern Power Company of Wisconsin. He was on the board of directors of Northern Power Company. He was on the board of directors of the City National Bank in Duluth and the board of directors of the Northeastern Power Company. Uh, this was a, a man that had drive and people wanted him around. Uh, he had ideas that, that, that pushed the, the process of the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes transportation process and the cities of Duluth and Superior well ahead of their time. We have a couple pic a picture of a couple whalebacks. Um, one of the one of the nice things about this picture is the the whaleback on the right. You can see that curve of the uh, the upper decks of the upper deck of the whalebacks. Um, most people don't know that it it was not flat on top. It was actually fairly rounded. So you had to be careful when you were walking on that spar deck. Um, I have never been able to count the exact number of whalebacks in this photo. I don't know if there's five or seven, but there's a lot. Uh, and again, this is the, the, uh, the process of beginning the whalebacks and then just finishing them up as the crews went from boat to boat. Um, Here's another one. You can see the ribs on the on the first one, the ribs and some plating on the on the one behind it. 
And then all the way in the rear, you can see a, a whale back that is almost ready to go. The stacks are on it, or the stack is on it. And it is uh, pretty close to being ready for the launch. Here's one of the, uh, one of the McDougal. Um, he lived in Duluth almost all of his adult life. He died in the bedroom of his home in Duluth, overlooking the Duluth Harbor and the uh, lift bridge on uh, Wednesday, the 23rd of May, 1923. Um, and at that point, certainly a, a, an era passed uh, in the Great Lakes shipping history. Again, Barge 101, this is kind of the VW bug of, of whalebacks. This was the first, this was the, the one that had absolutely nothing <laughs> just say it had no frills, no nothing, except the the space for cargo. That's it. That's all it had. Um, construction started in in late eight, late uh, eighteen eighty seven. The ends were built by Pussy and Jones in Delaware, while the center section of the hull um, was built in Duluth on Rice's Point for about $40,000. She was launched on uh, the 23rd of June, 1888. There's a story that Alexander McDougall's wife actually looked at her sister <laughs> and said, there goes our last dollar because McDougall couldn't get any funding to help him build this boat. So he did it with his own money. Um, and I don't think that that's far off from being true. The, uh, the, the, no one thought this was a good idea except Alexander McDougall. <clears throat> Excuse me. She was 187 feet long with a beam of 25 feet and a depth of 18 feet, three inches. And she could carry a maximum of 1,200 tons of cargo. Um, one of McDougall's ideas when he started building the whalebacks were that his barges would follow what's called it's quoted as called the line of strain. His belief was that the, the shape of the hull of his whalebacks would allow his whaleback barges to follow the steamers with very little, if any, rudder input from the, the whaleback barge. And because he had that belief, the, the rudder on barge 101 was extraordinarily small. In relationship to the size of that boat, it was almost non-existent. Um, on its first trip from Duluth to Cleveland, carrying about a thousand um, tons of iron ore, the, uh, the quote was that the barge went zigzagging all over the lake. Uh, he, McDougall had miscalculated. Uh, they needed a larger, rudder for these boats. So when they got to Cleveland, very, very quietly, he had several uh, ship carpenters build a much larger uh, rudder for the barge. And the performance of the barge increased dramatically. So he learned a lesson uh, from that experience. This is a photograph of the, the bow and stern um, frames of barge 101. They were built, as I said, by Pussy and Jones of Wilmington, Delaware, which was a shipbuilding company out in Delaware, um, because the stevedores who built the center section of, well, of barge 101, not shipwrights, but stevedores, um, didn't really have the expertise to put the, the uh, complex curves together in metal. So they, uh, the sections were built in Delaware. They were put together. They were disassembled piece by piece and then shipped to Duluth where the stevedores basically put them back together kind of like an erector set style um, and then attached them to the center section that they had made. Um, it shows you this photograph is a good example of 
just how large the boats were. They were not small boats. Um, you can see the, the men inside and on top of the, the ribs. And now we have some, some very high tech stuff coming up here. So <laughs> it's, uh, that is the bow of, the, of barge 101 with all the plating on it. Um, so you can now know what's above, outside, inside barge 101. Um, this was taken on Lake Superior just after her launching. Here's another very nice picture of barge 101 being towed by the steamer Yakima in the, uh, in the Sioux Locks. And you can see, uh, if, if, if you can remember the, uh, the photograph of the um, Colgate in the Sioux Locks that we saw a little bit earlier, and, and I talked about the, the shape of that hull as being a, a soft rectangle. And you can see that barge 101 is, again, so very much more rounded than the, the later whalebacks. This is another nice picture of the, the differences in the, the hull um, shapes. The whaleback on the left is barge 101. Um, the whaleback in the middle is barge 103. And the whaleback on the right is the steamer, Joseph L. Colby, kind of the papa pig, mama pig, and baby pig picture. It's kind of a family picture. Um, and you, again, you can see the changes in the, uh, the whole structure. Alexander McDougall, if, if nothing else, was always working on a better design, a better boat, tinkering. He was always working towards a better product. The Christopher Columbus, certainly the most famous whaleback ever built, um, was designed and built to carry passengers at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. It was built at a cost of $361,670.73. Um, she carried approximately 2 million passengers while, while servicing the, uh, the World's Fair. Now, I, I, I have to be honest with you, the, the trip that the Christopher Columbus took was a grand total of six minutes um, from one of the, uh, the wharfs to the, the Chicago World's Fair. But she had folks on her and she was on the water. So that still counts as how many people actually sailed on her. She was 360 feet long. She had a 42 foot beam. She had a 24 foot depth and she could carry 5,000 passengers. Um, she was the only whaleback built as a passenger liner. Um, I have to tell you that this, this picture was built between, or, uh, taken obviously between 1894 and 1899. And it's very sad to think that someone actually knows enough about this boat to know that little piece of information based solely on where her name is on the hull. It's just, it's kind of a sickness, I think. You shouldn't really know that much information about these boats. Um, after the World's Fair closed down, the, uh, the Christopher Columbus began daily trips between Chicago and Milwaukee, um, up and back each day. Um, for $1.50, you could, you could sail from Chicago to Milwaukee and back again. And I don't think you could walk to Chicago or to Milwaukee from Chicago for $1.50 today. Um, there was dancing, eating, sightseeing, and marrying on the Christopher Columbus. Um, the Christopher Columbus had a reputation. It was known as the marrying boat because evidently the good folks in Illinois had at least some standards when it came to who you could marry and uh, who you couldn't in, in their state. Um, and they actually imposed some time frames 
on couples who wanted to get married. Uh, evidently, Wisconsin didn't care whether you married your sister or not. So you could drive, you could ride the Christopher Columbus from Chicago to Milwaukee, and they had a justice of the peace on the dock. You could get married, and life is good. Um, I don't know how many brothers and sisters got married, but who knows? Um, every now and again, the Christopher Columbus would be hired by a private company to take employees or visitors, guests, uh, customers on short trips on Lake Michigan. Most of the time it was from Chicago to the western part of Michigan and then back again. Um, they called that the dustless, dustless road to happy land um, for the number of, of passenger boats that ran that specific route. Um, one of the, well, the highlights of the life of the, of the Christopher Columbus was the stability test that she underwent after the Eastland disaster in the Chicago River. Um, in July of 1915, the Eastland rolled over in the Chicago River, killing 845 people. Uh, it was a, it, it's a disaster that still has repercussions to this day. Um, the aftermath of the Eastland turning over was immediate and dramatic. What had, what occurred was that passenger, uh, passengers on boats on the Great Lakes pretty much ceased to exist. Uh, everyone was afraid that if the Eastland went over, why couldn't the Christopher Columbus or any other boat turn right over and kill another 845 people? Um, business was at a standstill for the passenger trade um, on Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes. So what, uh, what the folks on the Christopher Columbus did was they decided to prove how stable their boat was. They took 700 or 7,500 sandbags, placed them along her port side to simulate the, the weight of passengers all on the port side. They had a number of local government officials and federal officials on the boat. And then they had two tugs pull the, the Christopher Columbus on its, to try to turn it over. And they could not do it. The Christopher Columbus basically listed a grand total of 12 degrees. And the, uh, those, the reports of that test very literally saved the passenger of the day and uh, the passenger boat business. This is a photograph of the uh, Christopher Columbus after 1917. Um, you can see the open ports on her hull. That's how passengers got on and off the boat. They didn't go onto the deck. They, uh, they went through the, the, uh, the ports in the hull and then went up staircases to the upper decks. So here's another photo of, of the, Chris, the Christopher Columbus fully loaded with those, those hatches open. And they stayed open unless it was bad weather. Whether they were on the river or on the lake, they stayed open. So I always thought that was very interesting that, that they didn't close those hatches for some kind of safety issue. The, uh, the Christopher Columbus was scrapped in 1936. Um, there were attempts to save her. Some folks wanted to take her to the East Coast to make a restaurant out of her and it just didn't come to fruition. Um, in an odd kind of twist in 1936, the United States was still kind of friends with Japan and much of the steel that was cut away from the Christopher Columbus was sold 
to Japan, um, and obviously for their war effort. Um, so you, we really don't know how much of that steel came back uh, towards American servicemen. Um, but in another kind of ironic twist, the, the steam whistle for the Christopher Columbus was given to the city of Manitowoc for their air raid siren. Um, so the Christopher Columbus was on both sides a little bit. The Frank Rockefeller, the, the gray beard of all the whaleback vessels. Uh, she was launched in April of, of 1896. She's 380 feet long. Her beam is 45 feet and her depth is, is 26 feet. She could carry 5,200 tons of bulk cargo. Um, she is still serving to this day. Now, she's not uh, transporting coal or iron ore or anything else, but she is a, a museum ship in Superior, Wisconsin. And she's berthed about uh, a mile and a half from where she was built, uh, 100 and what, 25 years ago. Um, one of the interesting parts of the uh, the Frank Rockefeller, which was named after John Rockefeller's estranged brother, is you can see that there is a freestanding pilot house um, on the right side of the photograph, just in front of the uh, the coal bar or the uh, uh, the coal bunker of the of the Frank Rockefeller. Um, this is a photo of the Frank Rockefeller in color uh, after some changes that were made to the boat. You can see that the uh, pilot house is still freestanding, but it's been enlarged. The coal bunker has been enclosed. Um, it's riding light, as we can see, it's in the uh, Pittsburgh Steamship Company colors. Here's kind of this is one of my favorite pictures, but this is a, a picture of a whaleback doing exactly what a whaleback is supposed to be doing. Um, it, is, it is loading iron ore, and that's the only reason that the whalebacks were put into the water. This is exactly why Alexander McDougall put the whalebacks together. This is what they did for a living. Um, this is a photograph of the, of the Frank Rockefeller as she sailed under the na name of South Park um, between March 1923, I'm sorry, 1928 and September 1943, the, uh, the South Park sailed the Great Lakes. This is kind of the redheaded stepchild uh, stage of her, of her history. Nobody knows a lot about it. Nobody cares much about it. Um, you can see that on this picture, the freestanding pilot house is still there. And between the bow turret and the freestanding pilot house, you can see another structure in the middle of the boat. That is an elevator. Um, what they did was place a wooden deck, a flat wooden deck over the curved deck of the, of the whaleback and they transported cars from Detroit to Cleveland. And they would take, use that elevator to drop cars into the, uh, the, the hold of the ship so they could carry more cars. Um, during the, uh, the South Park era of this boat's life, she, she was almost schizophrenic. She, they, they just didn't know exactly what to do with her. In 1928, um, as soon as she was purchased, they reconfigured her into a sand dredge. In uh, the winter of 1936-37, she was refitted as an auto carrier with the flat deck that you see here. Um, in March of 1941, she was refitted again to carry both bulk freighter, break bulk freight and cars. Um, in 1942, she was reconfigured again as a straight bulk freighter. Um, I think by this time, several of the crewmen had 
complained of whiplash. They didn't know what boat they were going to be sailing on next. Whether it was a car carrier, a sand dredge, a, a freighter, a combination. Um, they, they, it, it must have been a little traumatic for them. In uh, November 1942, the South Park went on the rocks at uh, near Point Bessie, Betsy, Michigan, uh, during a storm. She was seriously, seriously damaged. Uh, lots of her hull plates were, were stove in, and she was in, in bad shape. She was towed to Manitowoc, uh, Wisconsin, so they could determine whether she was going to be repaired or scrapped. Had it not been for World War II and the need, the, the, the very desperate need for shipping tonnage, uh, the South Park would have been scrapped. But they decided to fix her up and put her back in service because they needed her abilities. In uh, September of 1943, the South Park left Manitowoc shipyards as a completely new vessel. Um, she was a, a liquid bulk carrier that could carry volatile liquids around the Great Lakes. 16 separate cargo holds were placed in her hold and she could carry anything from avgas to diesel to gasoline, any kind of volatile liquid that uh, needed to be transported over the Great Lakes, the Meteor could do. They also put on what was called a trunk deck, which is a very flat deck over her, her rounded spar deck um, for the equipment used in pumping the liquids in and out of the boat. Uh, this is a photograph of a uh, summer day in Duluth, as you can tell. Um, as the, the years went on, the, the sailing season became later and later and later. They pushed further and further into the winter. And this picture shows how, how tough that kind of sailing can be. You can see the ice on the, on the hull of the, of the meteor. Um, here is a, a stern view, <clears throat> excuse me, of the meteor. Um, the meteor sailed the Great Lakes until November of 1969. She sailed 71 years. That's just, that's just remarkable. Um, unfortunately, in, uh, in 1969, she ran aground uh, on the Gull Rock Shoal in Lake Superior. The cost of the, the repair was deemed excessive by, the, by her owners, and she was laid up. Um, what was going to happen to her was going to be determined at a later date. In September of 1972, after several years of negotiations and planning, the meteor was towed to, uh, to Superior, Wisconsin, and her life as a museum ship began, um, a life that continues to this day. She hosts thousands of visitors during the summer and early fall. Um, she's a, she's a, a remarkable boat. And it's just, it's such a joy to be able to go through her and, and see how she was built, why she was built, and the, the modifications that were made to her. Excuse me, just a second. One of my favorite whalebacks was the Pillsbury. <clears throat> Excuse me, the Pillsbury. Uh, along with her sister ship, the Washburn, were built as the only two package freighters um, by the uh, American Steel Barge Company. They were uh, built with what was called a tween deck um, for package freight, mostly flour. And they were in the, the boats were loaded through those hatches on the side of the boat. Uh, there were only two package freighters made, uh, another experiment by American Steel Barge. Uh, Pillsbury was, was launched in June of 1892. And just as kind of a harbinger of what her life was going to hold, 
um, the wave that she pushed up when she was launched into Howard's pocket, just uh, off the Superior uh, Duluth uh, Harbor, pushed a wall of water into the the uh, onlookers and dragged a very fair number of them into the water. Thankfully, no one was hurt, but it, it was a uh, it, it portended things to come. Pillsbury worked for four years hauling flour to Gladstone, Michigan uh, for the uh, Sault Ste. Marie Railroad line. About uh, four years after she was put into service, the Sioux Railroad line returned her to the American Steel Barge Company because it, they not only the Pillsbury, but the, the Washburn just weren't fulfilling the contractual obligations that were required of them. Um, kind of like a nautical lemon law kind of thing. So the American Steel Barge Company refurbished both of the boats. And in uh, 1896, sold the Pillsbury and renamed her the Henry Court. The Pillsbury, <clears throat> excuse me, had not great luck on the, on the Great Lakes. She had more than her fair share of dings and bangs. But the Henry Court had unmitigated bad luck through her entire life. There's a story that if uh, lake sailors or captains or lighthouse keepers wanted to know where the Henry Court was, all they had to do was look out on the lake and find the ugliest, nastiest, darkest cloud they could find. And the Henry Court would be directly under that cloud. Um, bad luck didn't follow the Henry Court. It's pretty much assumed that bad luck had its own cabin on the Henry Court. Um, in July of 1898, the Henry Court rammed while it was sailing backwards into the steamer state of New York near Cleveland. Uh, did some significant ja damage to the state of New York. Thankfully, no one was injured, no one was killed. Um, in, in 1901, the Henry Court rammed uh, the steamer C.S. Parnell in Lake Huron. Now, there might have been some discussion about who was at fault in the state of New York at Henry Court collision. There was no discussion about who was at fault in the Henry Court C.S. Parnell collision as the C.S. Parnell was at anchor when the Henry Court rammed into her. <laughs> um, the, uh, the Henry Court as, uh, as a, a package freighter for the Sioux Line and the Henry Court sinking. Uh, in kind of a thick and obvious irony, <clears throat> the Henry Court was rammed by the steamer Midville uh, near Lake Erie's Colchester Reef in December of 1917. Uh, as the Ram E, the Henry Court fared not very well um, as she did as the Ram Er. She always survived the ramming when she did it, but she didn't survive the ramming when she was the target. Um, she sank very quickly in 30 feet of water. And her owners, um, Pittsburgh Steamship Company, decided that uh, it was pretty close to, there were only a few days left for uh, Christmas shopping and the weather was rotten and the Henry Court wasn't gonna go any place. So they decided to leave her where she was and go pick her up in the springtime, haul her up, fix her and put her back in service. Henry Court had some other ideas. Um, the winter of 1917-1918 of, uh, 1917, on Lake Gary was vicious, vicious winter. The ice flows ripped off the superstructure of the Henry Court, ripped off the, the uh, bow turret, and it pushed the hull of the Henry Court four miles from where it sank. It took the crews 
looking for the Henry Court two weeks to find her. They knew exactly where she sank. And it took them two weeks to find her because she had moved so far along the bottom of Lake Erie. Um, okay, they found her. Let's raise her up, get her fixed up. Let's put her back in service. Well, that didn't happen either. The, uh, the Henry Court worked diligently to stay on the bottom of Lake Erie. It took until September of, eight, of 1918 for the, the folks to bring the Henry Court back up. That was after three failed attempts and then building a coffer dam around her. Um, they just had a horrendous time trying to, to recover this boat. After she was finally recovered in September of 1918, she was taken to Coney, Ohio, where she was completely outfitted and refitted. And you can see in this photograph, she has a flat deck, she has a much larger uh, bow housing. Uh, she has superstructure. There's no turrets. Um, this was her final configuration. Um, in May of 1927, the Henry Court ran aground. You're not going to believe this, but on Colchester Reef, where she'd spent about nine months, uh, a decade earlier, underwater. And she was on that reef for six days before they were able to to tow her off. In, uh, in 1927, the Henry Court was sold to a gentleman by the name of Andrew Green and his uh, Lake Ports Shipping and Navigation Company. Their, their uh, company was going to use the, the, the Henry Court as a scrap hauler. And for that reason, they refitted her with those two uh, steam cranes that you see on her deck um, for the unloading and loading of the scrap. Uh, in 1932, in June of 1932, things took a turn for the worse for the Henry Court when one of her crew members in Milwaukee was trying to uh, come back from shore leave, uh, fell off a ladder going up the, the hull hit his head on the deck and died in the water, drowned in the water. In the summer of 1933, the Henry Court ran down three fishermen uh, in their small boat in the Muskegon Harbor Channel uh, in Lake Michigan. Two of the fishermen died. One of the fishermen was saved by the crew of the Henry Court. In December of 1933, this is just, these all happened, these last three happened within six months of each other. The Henry Court touched bottom on Ballard's Reef in the Detroit River and was just barely able to get to her Nicholson dock when she sank right to the bottom of the river. One of the, uh, one of the uh, processes that the whalebacks were used for, and the Henry Court in specific, was as a, a uh, icebreaker because of the rounded hulls. Um, there was a rumor going around that uh, Mr. Green believed that he had so much bought a whale back that his own personal little piece of Hades after all those accidents. In November, 1934, final accident. The um, Henry Court didn't quite make it through the Muskegon Channel uh, Harbor entry and ended up against the North Breakwater. The, the Muskegon Coast Guard crew tried to save the, the crew that day or that night um, and lost one of their own in the process. He was swept overboard, a young man by the name of Jack Dipper, and he was never found. He's still in the arms of the lake. The entire crew was rescued the next morning by the, the Coast Guardsmen using a breeches buoy. You can see in this photograph, um, right smack dab in the middle, there is a, uh, one of the crew members on a breeches buoy going towards the breakwater. The, in December 10th, 1934, Mr. Green announced plans to pull the whale back, back up, fix her and put her in play again. Well, on the 26th of December, 1934, another storm came through the Muskegon area and ripped the Henry Court to pieces, rolled her over, and parts of her are still on the bottom today. Now, true to form, the uh, 
the Henry Court for her last little hurrah was valued at $75,000 and was fully and totally uninsured at the time of the uh, at the time of the wreck. Interestingly, um, most of Captain McDougall's Great Lakes whaleback spent a significant amount of time on salt water. By the end of the first decade of the 20th century, more than half the whalebacks were running along the East Coast and plying the, the Gulf Coast and sailing along the, the Pacific Ocean or the Pacific Coast of the United States. Um, also, a little known point of, of whaleback history is the fact that most of the 26 whaleback barges and steamers that sank did so um, in the Atlantic Ocean along the Northeast coast. Um, we can see here the, the approximate sites of the, the whalebacks that wrecked in the, uh, on saltwater. We also had eight whalebacks wrecked on the Great Lakes. The, uh, the Thomas Wilson outside of Duluth, Barge 115 at Pick Island in Lake Superior. Barge 129 near Vermilion Point. Barge Sagamore in Whitefish Bay. The Henry Court all over the place, but mostly in Muskegon. The Clifton in the middle of Lake Huron. The James B. Colgate off Long Point in Lake Erie. And Barge 104 in Cleveland. The meteor, the last surviving whaleback, uh, now serves, as I said, as a, as a maritime museum in Superior. You can take a tour. You can see all of the, the uh, internals and externals um, of, the, of the boat. It's, it's a remarkable place to visit if you really want to, if you really want to see anything about the, the whalebacks. Um, it's a great experience. And I'm sure that if you look here, Alexander McDougall is probably still keeping an eye on the meteor and the boys on his boats. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my ramblings. So thank you very much. Thank you, Neil. That was great. Um, had a few comments along the way. I'm trying to figure out how to restart my video here. There I go. All right, um, uh, let's see, Dan Cornelli early on asked about those hatch covers with them being so flat, that had to be a lot harder to handle than a typical hatch cover. Was there a special way they worked on that? They were, the hatch covers were, were as I said, flush with the, the spar deck. They were held down by bolts, uh, many, many, many bolts and a, a, a material called tallow that they used as kind of a gasket between the, the hull and the, the hatch cover. And as, as most smart captains and smart crews did, they had to bolt those things down all the way around, all the way down the spar deck every time they left port. And every time they got back to port, they had to unbolt them and move them. It must have been just a, a gigantic pain. Neil, were those wooden sectional hatch, hatch covers? No, sir, they were not. They were uh, they were metal. They were steel. How did they pick them up? Um, they had they they didn't have to to pick them up very far. Um, all they had to do was pick them up a few inches, and then they could push them over between. The hatch cover, the hatch holes, and they had pry bars that they could use to do that wow. and push them over. They didn't. It's not like today where they lift them up and then they take yeah. them and and set them down. You know, a hundred feet from where they were, they just pushed them over. There was one other question along the same lines with efficiency that, with them being hand loaded and unloaded, you commented that they were made to be fairly economical, but how is there any economy if it took so long to load and unload? Well, and, and that, that's one of the, 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 the downsides of the whalebacks. Um, but you have to remember that every boat was hand loaded and hand unloaded at that point, whether they were you know, 
uh, a wooden boat or a whale back or anything else. Um, there were pieces of equipment that that the the uh, crew and stevedores could use to unload the the bulk cargo. They had um, a funny shaped kind of uh, wheelbarrow that they could run across the the uh, the bottom of the deck and scoop up the the iron ore or the coal and and run it up a ramp, things like that. And they had a boatload of guys with shovels in there, throwing them into two uh, hoppers and things of that nature. So, I mean, they didn't do it shovel full by shovel full, but it was still very labor intensive. Very good. Um, I just want to mention everybody that in the chat, there is a link to renew your membership. So if you're looking <laughs> to do that, that's available there. If anybody would like to unmute themselves and ask a question, uh, you're welcome to do so at this time. Uh, you mentioned about stevedores only being able to do the work, the um, iron work, and yet stevedores, what do they do? Just load and unload ships? I don't understand that. A, a stevedore is a ship loader and a ship unloader. Um, yes. It, they, were not, they were not trained boat rights or ship rights. Um, they basically built the center portion of a metal tube. Oh. That's not, it's not terribly difficult to do if okay. you have someone in charge that knows how to do that. But the, the bow in the stern had some very complex curves um, that, that made them far above their, the stevedore's pay grade when it came to putting those things together. So that's what they had to um, go to Pussy and Jones in Delaware, a, a ship building company to, to put those two pieces of, the, of Barge okay. 101 together. All right, thank you. And thank you for the good presentation. Well, thank you very much, I appreciate that. There have been a lot of uh, congratulations posted in the chat. A lot of people saying fantastic presentation. One other earlier question that was posted is when fully loaded, it would seem that under heavy seas, the superstructure would be vulnerable. Were there cases of the superstructure being damaged? In the uh, the earliest, the, most of the whalebacks, if you take a look at them, the superstructure is not really a superstructure. It's a deck above the turrets at the at the stern of the ship. Um, the turrets were rounded and there was, a, there was a, a, a hatch in them to get inside so you could go up the stairs or down the stairs to either the deck or the, the crew quarters in the, the back end of the, the stern of the ship. But the, uh, most of the, the boats, most of the whalebacks were built with the, the cabins on top of those rear turrets. Now, some of the uh, some of the refits they put those those uh, superstructures right to the deck, like the Henry Court, um, the the Alexander McDougall had their their stern uh, housing right at the deck, but they were they were um, oh, wow. they were that um, uh, modified so that the, they could withstand the, the water. Very good. Uh, Jonathan, Sebastian, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question about, or your point of information, you'd be welcome to do that about the last captain of the meteor. If, if not, I'll make the point for you. Um, Jonathan Sebastian wrote that uh, point of information that the last captain of the meteor was Mike Malakovich, which was his mom's uncle, and his daughter is still living in Indianapolis today. I'll be darned. Well, that's great. I, I always love to, to get get those 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 stories where where folks have a a, 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 a touch with one of the whalebacks. I, I love I love those. 
I found that's been one of the best things about doing presentations that at the end, someone comes up and says, my uncle died on that shipwreck or was a survivor of it. And you just get these great stories that you never would have found if you weren't out there doing these presentations. So we really appreciate the work you do and willingness to come out and share this with us. Well, I appreciate you asking me. Oh, let's see, his daughter's with us here tonight. Uh, Michelle, I'm sorry about the pronunciation, Pavokovich uh, is here with us tonight. It was actually the, the captain um, that uh, was off duty, basically. And the, the one of the mates and the wheelman couldn't see uh, one of the lights, the, the lighthouses that they were looking for. Um, they had not been told uh, that the lighthouse was out of service. And they had to call the captain. And the captain came up. And he's the one that actually saw found um, the, the lighthouse that they were looking for. So he knew what he was doing. Um, sadly, by the time they saw it, the uh, the mate and the the wheelman had kind of veered a little bit off course, and they went up on the rocks of the uh, the uh, Gull Island Shoal. But had the captain, I think, been uh, on the bridge at the time in the pilot house, I think maybe the meteor would still be working today. All right, got your. Love it. <laughs> but I, I'm kind of one of those rivet counters with whalebacks. I'm, uh, I uh, got into it when the, uh, we lived up near Duluth and we went on the tour, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, long and the short, I started building model ships out of steel, 124 scale. And so I decided to build a whaleback barge. And I've got a freighter in my basement I'm working on, but it's a 28 gauge plate. I know what it's like to curve those bow, bow sections. But uh, about seven years ago now, I went up to the tour and I have the clipboard, my camera, my son with a tape measure. <laughs> and we're measuring rivets and all that stuff. So yeah, I'm getting to almost as bad as counting. You know, I can tell where the name's at at what time, so. <laughs> I'd love to see a, a photograph of your model. I I don't know how to get it to you, whether you have email or I posted it on uh, the Whalebacks page on Facebook. Oh, did you? Okay, I have oh. that. So I will, I will yeah, and I, and take a look. Yeah, and I can post some more. On the, on the, it was about three, four weeks ago. I have uh, one, like I said, well, the, the model I got, I carry on top of my car or van. And along with a, a regular conventional freighter, a uh, small one, but the, the model of the barge is 10 feet long. Wow. And uh, it, it floats. I got some really cool pictures of her load down to the curb. And then I get, I think it's on the page. You'll have to see it. But, yeah, uh, I'll absolutely take a look at that. And, and I'd love to see it. I love those models. Yeah, it, it's pretty cool. So. But love the presentation. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. I want to remind everybody, he does have two great books out there. If you want to learn more, they're certainly worth your while. Uh, recommend those. Um, thank, thank you, Jim. You. I appreciate that. Well, thank you for all the time and effort. Uh, there were a lot of great comments posted in the chat. Um, tonight's program has been recorded and it will be available here on the uh, museum's website. So come back and watch it often. We, uh, there's last month's programs up there and future ones will be as well. So uh, please join us again next month. And uh, I think unless anybody has any last comments or questions, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up for tonight then. I got one more quickie. Where were you at, Neil? Holland, Michigan. Okay. If I, I tell you what, too, and it goes for anybody. I live at the 40 Mile Point Lighthouse up near Roger City. Yeah. Yeah. And so I usually keep my models outside in the yard in the summertime. So come by if 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 anyone's here and see me, knock on the door. We're on the left side. So I'll well, now that I, more. now that I'm retired, I have a place to go. We'd love to. And, I, and would you sign my books? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs>
shameless promotion here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, Neil. Um, Thank you, Neil.